pretty full room today. Uh, good morning. Welcome, everybody. Uh, today we have Colonel John Dorian, Combined Joint Task Force Operation Inherent Resolve spokesman, back from his well-deserved mid-tour break and speaking to us from Baghdad. Sir, great to see you again. Can you, can you hear us? I've got you loud and clear, Eric. How do you read? Uh, we got you loud and clear. Uh, control room, maybe turn up the volume a little bit. Uh, when we go to ask the questions, we're going to pass around the mic. You know, we've had a few audio difficulties before, so uh, my partner over here will pass you the mic. Um, give Colonel Dorian a little clearer view there. Uh, Colonel Dorian's going to start with a short update on counter ISIS operations in Iraq and Syria, and then we'll turn to you for questions. And uh, Colonel Dorian, take it away. Thanks, Eric. It's good to be back answering questions. Good morning. We'll start in Syria and we'll move on to Iraq. The Syrian Democratic Forces and their Syrian Arab Coalition continue advancing as they further isolate Raqqa City. They continue to make progress in cleaning ISIS fighters from the territory in the vicinity of Tabqa, having cleared territory east and north of Raqqa, where they are now nearing positions to enable their assault to liberate the city. As they've cleared, they've repelled a significant number of ISIS attacks as the enemy struggles to slow their advance. In the last 24 hours, they've cleared 11 square kilometers east of Raqqa and toward Topka, where the enemy remains completely isolated. Our partnered forces have encountered tough resistance from ISIS in the area, encountering VBID, direct and indirect fire attacks, as well as the use of human shields, which the enemy continues to use to slow their advance. As we reported earlier this week, coalition and partnered Syrian opposition groups repelled an ISIS attack targeting the Antaf garrison uh, in southern Syria. ISIS initiated the attack uh, with a VBID and 20 to 30 fighters with the ground assault and suicide vests. Coalition and partnered forces engaged and defended against the ISIS attack with direct fire before destroying enemy assault vehicles with the, and the remaining fighters with coalition airstrikes. This is significant because the enemy has a track record of attempting spoiler attacks away from the main effort in an attempt to score propaganda points, which they hope will compensate for their lack of battlefield success against coalition and partnered forces. As in past attempts, they were unsuccessful and lost the fighters and the resources they brought to bear. This result also reflects the readiness of coalition and partnered forces to defend themselves, even when working in isolated areas. Moving on to Iraq, the Iraqi security forces continue making incremental progress on the west side of Mosul, as the enemy has intensified their exploitation of civilians by moving them in larger numbers into harm's way. Notably, the coalition has continued supporting the Iraqi security forces as they clear more deeply into West Mosul's dense urban terrain, uh, where nearly 500 square kilometers of territory have been cleared since operations in West Mosul commenced on February 19th. The 16th Iraqi Army Division continues securing East Mosul as a hold force. The Iraqi Federal Police and Iraqi Emergency Dis Response Division have continued their operations along the, Euphrates, the Tigris River, although their operations have been incremental due to enemy sniper fire and the use of human shields. The CTS continued progress uh, in the dense urban terrain of the old city, overcoming direct fire engagements from the enemy. And to the west of the city center, the Iraqi 36th Brigade cleared territory north of Badush. The Iraqi security forces retain control of both main routes west from Mosul, eliminating enemy freedom of movement. This enemy in Mosul is not going anywhere. With that, I'll be delighted to take your questions. Okay, thank you very much. And first we'll go to Idris Ali from Reuters. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Colonel, I uh, just wanted to sort of um, clarify something. I believe in February, February, General Townsend had said Mosul and Raqqa should be retaken in six months. It's now April. Is that timeline still 
possible? Well, I'm not going to get into the business of predicting timelines. Uh, we've continued to make good progress with our partnered forces in isolating the city. The enemy, once they're pinned down there, they're not going to be able to go anywhere. And we're going to continue to hammer them with strikes as our partners move in and retake the city. So uh, General Townsend, I know, has been very clear that it's our intent to do the very best we can to get this done on our watch. Uh, none of that has changed. We're doing this as quickly as we can. And one of the reasons for that is because the enemy, any area that they control, there's tremendous human suffering there. So we're going to continue our operations uh, at, at pace. Uh, we'll do those uh, operations as quickly as we can, but I'm not going to get into the business of predicting an end date. I'm going to jump to Ben Kessling from Wall Street Journal. Hey, Colonel Dorian. Uh, <clears throat> just a quick question on the relationship with Russia right now. What's going on with, uh, with deconfliction? What can you tell us about, uh, about that relationship with uh, U.S. forces and uh, Russian counterparts? Uh, have tensions ratcheted up, uh, especially with some of, the, uh, some of the diplomatic talk that's happening with uh, Secretary of State Tillerson and, uh, and President Trump? Or are, are, things, uh, are things still proceeding apace with military to military uh, discussions? Thanks, Ben. We, uh, we continue conducting our operations at pace. We've continued our strikes uh, in Syria. Um, despite the tensions that were a result uh, of the strikes that were conducted against the Syrian regime, uh, this is something that we're going to continue. The Secretary of Defense uh, uh, made clear uh, that he believes that we're operating in a safe uh, and effective manner and we'll continue to do that. We can't get into the business of discussing the day-to-day -day operations uh, with regard to any discussions or, or lack thereof with regard to the uh, deconfliction line doing so uh, from my conversations with the people that are directly involved in that before. Uh, is that that was not a productive thing to do, and that's the reason that we, we are no longer um, doing readouts of, of what those discussions are, and uh, we will not get back into that business. So, thank you. Okay, uh, I understand that, uh, but can you just comment real quick on how the relationship is between U.S. and Russia uh, as far as the deconfliction stuff goes? I mean, are, are there still uh, conversations happening, and can you talk at all about at what level those conversations are happening. Yeah, I'm, af I'm afraid I can't answer that for you. That's, uh, that's exactly what we're, we're just not going to be able to discuss. Um, again, uh, the Secretary of Defense is satisfied that we're conducting uh, our operations in a safe manner. I know yesterday he told you that he felt that uh, we were adequate, adequately deconflicted, and we'll continue our operations and accelerate them any way that we can to get these uh, areas liberated from Dash. Stop with Bob Burns here, and then we'll go to Qasem Aleri after that. Uh, Colonel Dorian, um, I think you said that strike operations in Syria are continuing apace. Uh, earlier this week, CENTCOM said that offensive uh, operations had slacked off somewhat uh, in the aftermath of the cruise missile strike in order to do more defensive uh, operations. Can you explain whether things have fully returned to the normal, so to speak, or are you still doing uh, fewer offensive strikes? Well, in, in the last uh, week, from the 4th to the 11th, we've conducted 123 strikes. Uh, for the operations uh, toward isolating and ultimately liberating Raqqa. So that's a significant number of strikes. Um, you know, we have made adjustments to our operations uh, to account for the, you know, the potential tensions that resulted as, uh, from the uh, uh, strikes that were conducted because of the Syrian regime's chemical attacks. But uh, make no mistake, we do plan on continuing our operations and we do continue uh, to look for ways to accelerate them.
And next we get a Katsum O'Leary from Anadolu. Yeah, hi, Colonel. Uh, welcome back. Since the strike on Sharia Air Base, could you tell us whether the number of U.S. troops or the amount of the equipment on the ground in Syria have increased or not? Uh, we continue to remain uh, uh, within our um, force management level, uh, and we do continue to have uh, troops that come into and out of uh, Syria uh, as necessary in order to conduct operations. Uh, as far as the specific numbers that are there, uh, we're not going to do uh, real-time reporting on exact numbers. Um, so uh, I really can't give you a tremendous amount of fidelity on that. What I can say is that uh, there's been no real substantive change in, uh, you know, where we're headed, the numbers uh, of troops that we have uh, as a result of what's, what's happened. And a follow-up on Ben's question, um, could you tell us whether the deconfliction channel is currently open with Russians? And have you used it during this week, like from Monday to today? Thank you. Yep, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just not going to be able to get into uh, the day-to-day -day reporting of the status of deconfliction. We're just not going to do that. OK. All right, thank you, Kasim. And next, we have Corey Dickstein from Stars and Stripes. Hey, Colonel Dorian. Uh, I wanted to see, are there still negotiations going on with uh, any role Turkey might play in the liberation of Raqqa? We, uh, we continue to talk to Turkey nearly every day, and we continue to remain open for a possible role uh, for them. Um, as far as the substance of those discussions, uh, that's something that, you know, it's a, more of a diplomatic effort and a mill-to-mill -mill effort that's best left, uh, you know, in a, in a, uh, in a diplomatic and mill-to-mill -mill discussion. So as far as the substance of those discussions and where they are on that, uh, I don't have anything new to report. Uh, but, you know, this uh, Turkey has played a tremendous role in rolling back ISIS territorial gains. Uh, and that's something that we welcome and, and uh, would love to see continue. Uh, in the meantime, we do continue to do our work with our partnered force to isolate Raqqa. And that city is going to be liberated. One more. Um, is the SDF at this point, are they properly equipped to carry out that, that liberation? And is there anything? additional equipment-wise, backing-wise, that they might need to uh, defeat ISIS in, in uh, Raqqa? Well, as you know, the coalition has brought additional firepower into Syria in order to support the, uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces and the Syrian Arab Coalition uh, in their advance. Uh, that comes in the form of marine artillery and also um, Apache gunships, which have been instrumental in supporting their advance in areas like Topka uh, and in and around uh, the areas that uh, surround Raqqa. So um, we've brought those to bear as far as what additional other capabilities might be brought in. Uh, I think that's a conversation for another day. Okay. Thank you. And next we go to David Martin, CBS. John, uh, you mentioned the uh, exploitation of civilians in uh, West Mosul. Uh, while you were away, uh, Colonel Skoraka uh, told us about a video um, that uh, he said showed civilians being smuggled into a, uh, a building in ISIS where, uh, in uh, West Mosul, where uh, they would then become uh, uh, casualties uh, if an American or coalition strike was conducted on that building. Uh, but we haven't seen that video. Do you know what happened to it? And I have a, another question. Uh, 
Yep, I know that uh, the video was sent to U.S. Central Command Headquarters for further review. Uh, I believe uh, that's, uh, that's probably where to follow up with regard to the release timeline because my understanding is preparations are being made or, uh, you know, review is underway there as far as uh, whether that will be released and, and uh, at what time it will be released. Whether on the question of whether strikes have been uh, scaled back in in Syria, I, I briefly glanced at the uh, strike summary today, and it was a, a particularly small number of strikes uh, in in Syria. Um, is that because of weather, deconfliction problems, or force protection? Yeah, in, in any given day, the number of strikes uh, will fluctuate, David, and uh, some of the, all the factors that you described uh, could play a role. So we've had some bad weather the last several days, and I think we're going to have uh, a few more days of very tough weather. But I would say any opportunity that we have to conduct strikes or to accelerate them in order to support the, our partners' advance, we're going to take that opportunity and do so. Um, so I wouldn't take any temporary uh, small number, you know, just a snapshot in time uh, as anything that uh, changes that intent. We're going to get this done as quickly as we can. We're going to conduct our strikes to support our partners because one of the things that's very important to understand is that millions of people have been able to return to their homes because of the rollback. Uh, of ISIS territorial gains. And a lot of the reason for that is the coalition airstrikes that have supported our partners as they've taken that territory back. There just wouldn't be anywhere near as the number of people that have been able to return to their homes without those strikes. And I think that's uh, a very important point for people to understand. Okay, and I am at strike two with the name, sir. I've... Jim, Michaels, sir. Jim, I'm sorry about that. What is the principal ISIS tactic that's, uh, that they're using in an effort to slow uh, Iraqi forces' movement into West Mosul? Is it uh, IEDs? Is it use of human shields? Uh, you know, what is the key factor that's sort of inhibiting the, uh, the movement into West Mosul at this point? Yeah, thanks, Jim. I would say no single tactic. Uh, they have a layered defense, and they've had two years to build it. Uh, unfortunately, one of the ones that's uh, most problematic and difficult is their use of human shields. They've intensified their efforts to bring civilians into harm's way. Um, this is something that uh, is a despicable and cowardly tactic. Uh, but make no mistake, they had two years plus to dig elaborate defenses. We've seen them use commercial off-the-shelf drone technology. We've seen them use snipers. Uh, we've seen them use VBIDs. And now, as we move into this very dense urban terrain on the west side of Mosul, uh, where the you know, roads uh, may not even really be qualified as what most reasonable people would call a road, they're, they're so narrow that it channelizes the advance for the Iraqi security forces. Uh, that combination of things, explosives, booby traps, snipers, the use of civilian shields just makes it very slow and difficult going. Uh, the Iraqi security forces continue their advance, but it's very, very difficult. Uh, and it's just going to remain so for a while. And we're going to keep working through that. Uh, with each passing day, the number of ISIS fighters in Mosul goes down. The amount of resources they have available to continue their mayhem goes down. Uh, and ultimately, they're not going anywhere, and they are going to be defeated. Jim, sorry about that. That was strike two. We will not get strike three. Next, we move over to Courtney Kuby from NBC. One follow-up from one of your earlier answers. You said that um, when you were referencing the number of strikes near Raqqa this week, that um, 
um, that there were adjustments to operations to account for tensions following the strikes last Thursday. What kind of, can you give us an example of, of how those ten tensions may be manifesting? What are you seeing that, that shows tension? Well, you know, you know, you've seen the public statements. Uh, I don't have to, to uh, regurgitate those for you. But what I would say is when you see those types of public statements and you know that uh, you're doing something uh, that changes the dynamic, uh, it's just appropriate to make sure that you're, you're uh, taking appropriate measures to account for that. We don't want to be reckless. Uh, and we don't want to have some type of incident that would... Uh, cause a miscalculation or some type of unintended incident. So uh, I probably uh, cannot get deeply into exactly what the adjustments are in the interest of force protection and maintaining operational security, but I would say that uh, it is certainly appropriate to say we made some adjustments to what uh, our forces in Syria were doing to account for the fact that uh, the, the uh, strikes against the Syrian regime uh, chemical capability did increase tensions there. Uh, it was just appropriate to do that, but I can assure you that uh, the intent is to get back uh, as quickly as possible to uh, our normal operations and as fast a pace as we can manage uh, to defeat ISIS and help our partners so that they can liberate uh, the remaining territory that Daesh control. And then one more, uh, I know you don't want to talk about deconfliction specifically, but um, we, we've heard for months now that there are close calls, or however, however you want to call them, with Russian aircraft over Syria. It's not that uncommon. Um, have you seen any uptick in that over the last week or so? Are you still seeing uh, any kind of close calls between U.S. and Russian aircraft, whether it's intentional or not? Uh, no, if not, uh, but I would say that all the things that we observed before uh, continue to exist. Uh, both sides uh, do observe the other's operations and assess what's happening, um, and that'll continue. That's not anything new. Um, it's just something that we're, we're all cognizant of, uh, and that'll continue. Next, we move to Barbara Starr, CNN, in the back corner. Colonel Dorian, to follow up on David and Courtney and several other people, I, I, I'd like to ask you to try to be as precise as you can. You just said that you hope to get back to normal operations as quickly as you can in Syria. So is the downturn specifically in airstrikes that continues right now due to force protection, deconfliction, plus weather, because you've just told us that you're not at normal operations. And then I have a follow-up. Yep, I, I think I've probably been about as specific as I can, Barbara. Um, we have experienced some very tough weather. Uh, we have made some adjustments based on uh, force protection and the increased tensions. Uh, all those things have to be taken into account. But uh, make no mistake, uh, we do plan on accelerating any time that we're able. And again, uh, as I've said many times, any ISIS resources in Syria or Iraq, regardless of where they are, are subject to attack by coalition air, artillery, whatever resources that we can bring to bear to bring about their destruction. So fighters, resources, anything that uh, the enemy is using to resist the advance of our partnered forces, all those things are subject to attack and we'll take every opportunity that we can uh, to safely and with precision destroy those capabilities. Two follow-ups. You said you had said on deconfliction at the beginning, your words, it was not productive to talk about it. Can you please explain what is not productive? Why is it not productive, in your words, to talk about it? And you also described Mosul fighting right now as incremental. So I take that to mean it's not going as planned. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you meant about incremental 
as well as not productive to discuss deconfliction. Yep, the uh, the military to military discussions between us and Russia on deconfliction uh, previously. Um, Having day-to-day -day discourse about what those discussions are uh, is a departure from their purpose. Their purpose was always uh, to conduct those discussions uh, to protect safety of flight, not as some type of uh, effort to do public statements or uh, that sort of thing. And so uh, these are discussions that we just want to keep focused on uh, what they are intended to do, uh, safety of flight, uh, so we're not going to get into the day-to-day -day discussions anymore, um, and that's uh, just how we'll have to do it from here on out. With regard to incremental in Mosul, um, that word is uh, an accurate description of what's happening. The Iraqi security forces do continue to advance, so um, we knew that it was going to be very difficult. Uh, we've been saying for months that the enemies had an opportunity to dig elaborate defenses, that it was going to be very hard. We've said for many months that as we got into the old part of the city, uh, the dense urban terrain there, that it would be extraordinarily difficult. And what we're seeing is exactly what we expected to see. Um, so I'm just trying to give you an accurate description of what's happening. I don't want to say that, hey, they continue to advance uh, at pace when in reality it's very, very slow and very, very hard, and it's gut-busting, difficult fighting between our forces and theirs. Uh, but our forces and the Iraqi security forces continue to make progress. It's very slow. It's very tough. One of the reasons for that is because we want to do it in a manner uh, that protects civilian life. Prime Minister Abadi has been very clear on that, and it's been an enduring principle of the campaign throughout. So. Um, if it has to be done slow, that's how it's going to be done. Um, and, uh, but we're going to continue. And, and I take it that you've just said you do continue to have going anywhere, and they are going to be destroyed uh, in Mosul. Process, however, you don't want to talk about it, but you do continue to have, I think you just said, day-to-day -day discussions with the Russians. Nope, I didn't say that. I told you we're not going to discuss it. To Cammy McCormick, CBS Radio News in the Colonel corner. Colonel explain to us, please, why it's detrimental to talk about the deconfliction talks. You've been talking about them up until now. You've called them useful. You've called them effective. You've said that they've, they've saved pilots' lives. That would lead a lot of people, the fact that you're not speaking about it now would lead a lot of people to believe they're not going on now. Why can't you just say, are the deconfliction talks going on with the Russians through this channel currently, or are they not? Yeah, I'm not going to get into that. We're not going to discuss it. It's as simple as that. Uh, it wasn't productive for us to continue doing it, and so we're not doing it anymore. Tom Bowman, NPR. Uh, Colonel, uh, could you talk about what's been going on in Idlib uh, since the chemical attack? Presumably the Russians and the Syrians are forging ahead to take over that area. How many airstrikes have you seen from uh, either side, uh, ground movements? Just talk about what you've seen since the chemical attack. Tom, I'm afraid I really can't get into that with you because it doesn't really have uh, a direct um, relationship to the fight against ISIS. We uh, continue to focus our energy here uh, at Combined Joint Task Force Operation Inherent Resolve on supporting our partners who are isolating Raqqa. Um, so what's happening in Idlib, I think, would probably be best uh, directed to U.S. Central Command. I've I, I hope you understand. It's just not really our portfolio. I want to follow up on Corey's question about uh, support for the Syrian Kurds and Arabs. Uh, I've been hearing that as early as next week, uh, the Pentagon will go to Congress and request what's called 1209 funds to provide uh, small arms, also heavy machine guns 
to that force. Can you talk a little bit about the way ahead with that? Yeah, I, I don't have any update for you on that. What I can say is uh, right now our efforts have been directed toward uh, providing resources, equipment, and light weapons to the Syrian Arab Coalition. Uh, that is the, uh, the current state of play. As far as any new developments on that, that's a, a discussion probably for another day. Uh, and if there's anything new on that, I think it will probably be announced from OSD Public Affairs. On, on Mosul, it sounds like what they're doing now is sort of encircling Mosul. Is that correct? Um, Mosul has been encircled for quite some time. What's happening now uh, is that as the CTS in the uh, Iraqi Federal Police and Emergency Response Division press more deeply into the very dense urban terrain along the Euphrates River and in the old part of the city, uh, the 9th Iraqi Army Division uh, continues clearing territory to the north and to the west uh, of the center of the city and then reducing the size of the cordon uh, where, you know, the, and this is the, the uh, territory that the enemy still retains some degree of freedom of movement. Uh, but uh, the freedom of movement is only within that shrinking cordon. Uh, they're not going anywhere. They're not going to be able to leave to the west. Uh, they are cut off. So the force that's in uh, the west side of Mosul, the, the uh, fighters that are there, they have really two choices. They can surrender to the Iraqi security forces or they're going to be killed. Okay, and next we move to Paul Shinkman, U.S. News. Thank you, Mr. Colonel. Um, just to follow up on the activities of the Syrian Air Force, by some assessments, the strike last week wiped out as much as a fifth of their operational aircraft. Have you seen a proportional reduction in their conducting airstrikes? Have you seen any noticeable difference in, in their air activity? Perhaps are you seeing more Russian involvement to make up for that shortcoming? Yeah, Paul, I, I, uh, I understand your question. I'm afraid it's really not within our portfolio. This is something that's probably best directed to U.S. Central Command. Um, you know, we continue to focus on ISIS. Um, we've not really detected any discernible uh, change in the impact of uh, what we intend to do. Uh, we've made some adjustments in the interest of making sure that we account for any increased tensions, but uh, as far as uh, impact of what those strikes are, uh, it's just not directly related to what we are doing. Uh, separately, we'd seen some reports in recent weeks of ISIS fighters moving south from Raqqa and Mosul into sort of southeast Syria and into west Iraq. Is that a trend that you're still noticing? And do you see any significant sort of... Um, massing or not massing but sort of uh, um, rallying of forces there yeah any time that the enemy remains under pressure in one area they are going to try to look for places to go uh, this is one of the reasons why we have a force in southern Syria at uh, the Antaf garrison, they continue to work with partnered forces to further reduce enemy freedom of movement uh, in the open desert in the areas that are uh, more remote uh, south of Raqqa. So this is something that we continue to build upon. You know, the enemy uh, thought probably that they had a window of opportunity or the potential to conduct a strike where uh, we had forces that were operating in a fairly remote location. Uh, they were wrong about their ability uh, to conduct a successful attack. They were routed. Uh, once they made their initial attack, things turned south for them very quickly. Uh, and this is an example, working with those partnered forces in some of these remote areas. We're not just working in these uh, major areas like Raqqa and Mosul. 
We continue to work with our partnered forces uh, in Syria and in Iraq to eliminate these other areas where uh, ISIS might wish to go. Uh, we want to make sure that that's a wish. Okay, and next to Jamie Crawford, Washington Examiner. Jamie McIntyre. Jamie McIntyre, I'm sorry. There's too many Jamies in this place. Uh, right? Um, in this Colonel. World. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Uh, Colonel, I, just, I understand that you're not the releasing authority anymore for this video that uh, purportedly shows ISIS hurting people into buildings in Mosul and uh, even executing someone on the spot. But do you think it undercuts the U.S. credibility when you make that kind of allegation of a really spectacular atrocity, a war crime, claim that you have the video to back it up? say that you're going to release it shortly and then it never gets released because it doesn't appear we're going to see that video anytime soon. Yeah, the, the decision to release or not release the video now resides at CENTCOM, so I'll refer you to them with regard to that. What I can tell you is that uh, the atrocities of ISIS are well documented not just by us, uh, but by witnesses on the ground, human rights groups. Um, there, are, there is uh, a, a, their own releases uh, of videos. They've hung people uh, as an example uh, to others in the western side of Mosul, and they leave them hanging there uh, as an example of uh, what will happen to people who try to escape the city. That's well documented by a lot more than just the coalition. So if, you're, if you have any doubts about what the enemy is all about, um, you don't just have to ask us. You can look at their own videos. You can talk to human rights groups. You can talk, uh, you know, several media uh, who are operating in Western Mosul have talked to plenty of witnesses on the ground, uh, there is ample evidence that all these things are happening, whether or not that video gets released or not. Just a, a quick follow-up. Has there been any change in the assessment that ISIS is using this tactic of forcing groups of people into locations where they will potentially become mass casualties and thereby uh, you know, stoke outrage against the coalition? Is that? Is, has there been any change to the assessment that that's what occurred in this incident in Mosul where so many civilians were killed? And has there been any change in their tactic? Are they still using that tactic? Uh, the enemy does continue to use that tactic. That's among the many things that uh, you see from multiple uh, witnesses people that have been victims of that. Uh, with regard to the specifics of the uh, March 17th strike, that's still under a, uh, an investigation, a 15-6 investigation conducted by uh, an Air Force officer here. Um, so I don't want to get ahead of that investigation with regard to that specific incident. Uh, but there is a, a growing body of uh, evidence that those types of things are happening. Human rights groups have done a lot of interviews. Uh, we have seen reportage of it from media who are on the ground that have discussed it uh, with uh, some of the victims of that. Um, so yes, the enemy does continue to do that. Uh, it's a despicable tactic and unfortunate uh, and heartbreaking, uh, but it, it is something that we're seeing. Okay. Thank you. Poor Jamie Crawford gets more of my emails for Jamie McIntyre. I just can't, can't get them straight, right? Uh, next, we move to uh, Ryan Brown, CNN. Hello, Colonel. Thank you for doing this. I just wanted to follow up on Paul's question really quickly. I know you, you don't want to speak necessarily to the regime's air operations, but the Russian Ministry of Defense today said that the cruise missile strikes had a direct effect on their campaign against ISIS. I know a few months ago, I think you said that you started to see an uptick in both the regime and Russia's airstrikes against ISIS due to fighting around Palmyra and, and Deir ez -Zor. Have you seen any impact on their efforts in recent days to fight ISIS? Have, have, are you seeing any activity by the Russians or the regime in Damascus to fight ISIS? Yeah. 
Yeah, as far as what the impact is against ISIS, I think that's um, something that we'll have to observe and see. What I would say is uh, the strike was conducted because of the chemical weapons uh, use against the people of Syria. Uh, and uh, as a result, um, you know, they, they have, uh, they've had their capabilities reduced. So if they would like to uh, continue to uh, ramp up their campaign against ISIS, um, it would be best and in their interest to not use chemical weapons so that some of their capabilities will remain. And next goes to Lucas Tomlinson with Fox. Colonel, since the cruise missile strike, have the Russian or Syrian regime forces made any threatening moves toward U.S. troops on the ground in Syria? No. Iranian forces or Iranian proxy forces? No. Uh, can the American people expect any more U.S. troops going to Iraq or Syria anytime soon? Well, I think that's, uh, that's a conversation for another day. Uh, as you know, the, uh, the president has ordered a, a review of the campaign to determine uh, what can be done to accelerate the campaign against ISIS. Um, I understand that uh, a shell of a plan is uh, coming together, but uh, as far as what might happen in the future, uh, that is a, a discussion for another day. It's not something that uh, we would speculate on from here. And even though we converse every day, I've forgotten your name, ma'am. I'm sorry. OK. Um, uh, just a follow up to your answer to Jamie McIntyre's question. Um, you mentioned the airstrike in West Mosul on March 17th and um, the investigation to that. When can we expect a report, like a final report? Mm-hmm. Well, as you might imagine, with uh, an incident of the high visibility nature and, and uh, the possibly very uh, difficult outcome there, um, there are going to be uh, levels of review for the, the investigation result. Uh, so I don't want to get into an exact timeline for when that will be done and when it will be released. What I would say is uh, I spoke with the investigating officer uh, today and he continues to gather information. He continues to speak with witnesses. Uh, I know that there's been some uh, lab work conducted to try and, you know, look at some samples of uh, various substances that were found around the sites. There have been engineers and experts brought in. Uh, there have been a lot of witnesses uh, interviewed, including media who were present or or had. Uh, access to people in this, the scene uh, in the, the, uh, the time since the strike was conducted. So we continue to gather information. The intent is to get as comprehensive a picture as we possibly can about what's happened uh, and then uh, to be as transparent as we can with regard to exactly what happened and what uh, steps uh, are needed in the, the, uh, the follow-up from what's happened. Just a quick follow-up. I mean, you mentioned transparency, and that's something that uh, Lieutenant General Townsend mentioned as well. I mean, are you encouraging um, organizations like Amnesty to conduct their own investigations or um, perhaps get involved in or supply material to this investigation? And can you talk a bit about what you mean by transparency? Well, we're going to release the results of our investigation. So, um, you know, there are areas where there may be some classification of specific capabilities or uh, that sort of thing, but we're going to release as much information as we can and give people a good picture uh, of what's transpired. As far as, uh, you know, the various groups that also review what's happened, um, I know that General Eisler has spoken with uh, several of them. Uh, and he will continue to gather information from whatever sources uh, he can to get as clear a picture as we can. 
Okay, and a second question from Qasem Aleri Anadolu. Colonel, um, U.S. troops were in close proximity with the Russians and regime forces in Mambij. And is this proximity still being kept, or does the U.S. forces still do the U.S. forces still see the Russians around Mambij, or have you moved back them um, in a distant place to as a measure of uh, you know an adjustment to the force protection measure? Thank you. No, our forces continue uh, their work uh, in that area. Um, and uh, yeah, no nothing is uh, really changed with regard to that. We could hand the mic back and go to Louis Martinez, ABC. I think our sound quality has gotten a little bit better, but uh, let's be safe here. Hey, John, one quick question about the deconfliction line. Are there policy discussions underway with Russia, uh, between the Russian government and the U.S. government as to the status of the deconfliction line? Louis, that, that's a discussion that's probably best uh, had at OSD level uh, as far as a policy discussion. Um, I'm not aware of anything, but uh, if there is anything on that, I think they'll have it for you. And just to follow on to, uh, I think, Kasim's question about Manbij, um, has the U.S. posture there changed in any way? No. Okay, any more questions? All right, well, that wraps up today's brief. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Colonel Dorian. Glad to have you back again. <clears throat>